So, Paul, I'm really excited about this. So what have we learned? Well, lots. Uh, a number of these things have now been seen. Here's one of the early ones. Um, this is a star. Um, and you can see here's the data from Ogle that the star didn't change in brightness for a very long time, about a thousand days. It was a very boring star. Then suddenly, around uh, mid-July 2005, you see it started inching up in brightness. Right, okay. And so it started getting a little bit brighter, and so they would have been able to send the alerts, presumably. Yep. And then it started, started really climbing around here. They've got less data. I assume yeah. it was cloudy or something around there. Um, but by this point, it's climbing quite fast, and they were able to fit the microlensing curve and realize yeah. something was going on. So this point, new warning went out, and people around the world started following up. So, for example, the telescopes in Australia, Perth, the uh, Danish telescope in, in Chile, MOA in New Zealand, and as the world rotated, these telescopes would come online. You see it was happening over several days. So it got brighter and brighter and brighter, peaked at about magnification of three. So presumably, as you watch this coming up, it all it looks like it's just a big magnification event. and. Just so, a star. Just a star, okay. So just a star, just a star, just a star, just a star, just a star. Oop, what happened there? Um, oh, there's a little blitch in it, yes. Mm. And if you zoom in on that, you can see this blitch is a long way outside the error bar. So what's a pretty small glitch, it's very real. And that's exactly what we were expecting. We were expecting a big star pattern with a glitch on the side. Right, and so the fact that that glitch is really narrow tells you it's something that's not that massive. So Yeah, in this case, it's a caustic. You've crossed a caustic here, most likely. Right. So the caustics are very narrow. So you can see this is only going over a few hours, this narrow spike. Okay. So without the whole network of telescopes around the world, um, you wouldn't be able to follow this up. And so their analysis of this, and because you, know, you have a fair bit of information here, yep. it, they were actually able to be the first group using this very tricky technique to find something that looks like a super Earth. That is, a planet that is bigger than the Earth, but smaller than a Neptune. Yes, this is the first one, because this came before all the results from Kepler and the transits. So we're talking 5.5 Earth masses. The error bars are uh, asymmetric, so there's a big uncertainty in the upward direction and a smaller uncertainty in the downward direction. So it could be uh, twice that, it could be uh, 11, or, but it, or it could be half that down to uh, maybe two Earth masses. But anyway, so it could be just about as big as uh, Neptune or something like that. So we don't know if this is a gas giant or a rocky planet. Yep, once again, all we know is the mass. So we know the gravity and that's it. So the super Earth, we've seen lots of super Earths before. Yeah. Um, but the interesting thing is this one's a long way out. All the super Earths that have been found by Kepler, they're all very close in. Orbital appears within 50, um, 50 days. This one is 2.6 astronomical units out. That's a little bit beyond where Mars is in our own solar system. Okay, in, so in this part is of the getting into belt. being something that looks and smells a bit more interesting with respect to our own solar system. So it looks like super Earths are not only close in, but they're also further out. We've, for the first time, been to see planets out at a decent distance. So is this the only one we've seen? Uh, no, there are more. Let's some, show you some examples. Here's a rather more complicated one. Um, now you've got data from both Ogle and MOA, the two, two surveys. Um, here's the Ogle data once again showing didn't do anything, didn't do anything, didn't do anything until suddenly it started climbing. Um, likewise, Ogle found the same. Um, it didn't look like they triggered uh, the MOA found the same, so here's their data, nothing, 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 nothing spikes. Okay. Doesn't look like there's much follow-up data here, so it's probably just their own data from the surveys. So on they these weren't ones. able to sound the alarm in this case, obviously, or maybe that uh, surveys weren't in place yet. But nonetheless, uh, it looks like something's happened. The model says there's a big glitch here. They didn't actually manage to zoom in on that. Let's, let's zoom in a bit. So, but certainly, oh, okay. it was climbing here. It would have been nice to get an observation right up there, but that was probably just a gap between two exposures or a cloud went over or something. Uh, we get down again. This time, the second spike, they managed to actually get an observation they at the top. It, yes. And also nail the shape around here. So, so it's a very complicated shape, which means that you can learn a lot about the system. Yeah. Right? In addition to these two big variations, there are a couple of small ones off elsewhere uh, that you can hardly see. And combining these all, you've got multiple caustic crossings. In this case, it turns out you've got a 1.5 Jupiter mass object about three astronomical units out. So that is something that's very similar to Jupiter. It's not quite as far out as Jupiter. A bit bigger and not quite as far up, but beginning to look but like it a... looks pretty good. It's got to be the closest thing we have to Jupiter, at least. Uh, I mean, this was in 2004. Yeah. Now, it's not always that obvious. Here's another example of a, a microlensing event, and that pretty much looks like there's just a star if you eyeball it like this. Yep. Um, this is a very quick thing. You're looking at only a few hours across here. You can see it was being observed by telescopes in, um, in New Zealand. 
then it was picked over by an amateur astronomer in South Africa who followed it through the maximum and then down here it started getting picked up by uh, telescopes in, in Chile as the Earth rotated. But the uh, South African got lots and lots of data, very quick, very accurate things. And if you try and fit a model for a single star lensing event to this, you see it doesn't quite fit. There are a few little wiggles around it. So these are tiny little wiggles in this case, which means that the thing probably just wasn't lined up. You didn't really go through a caustic as much as other things. Well, it turns out in this case, um, what's most likely the reason why the wiggles are small is what's called finite source problems. So here's a model fit to the data, and you see it can fit the wiggles. Yeah, this, this is like a very hard thing to fit, but you can yep. actually can fit it all very well. The idea is that here's the image plane, here are the caustics, these blue and green lines, two different models. It, oh. Everything we've been doing so far, we've been assuming the background source is a point. Oh. But in fact, the background source is a star, which has a finite diameter, which is comparable in size to the caustics in this case. So, say this part of the star, as it drifts across, will be lens quite a lot because it's going over the caustics. That part so won't be so much. So that's only a tiny little piece of the star is magnified. Yes. Ah, okay. So, so uh, because in this case, the star is comparable in size to the caustics, bits of the star are being magnified, bits are not. So you have to allow for that. But if you allow for it, you get to see a pretty good fit. And since most of that data is from an amateur, it really does go to show that uh, amateurs with modern equipment can really be at the cutting edge of astronomy right now. Yep. In this case, we've got something a little smaller than Saturn, uh, which is 1.25 astronomical units out. So something like Saturn at the approximate place of Earth. So this could be one of the eclipt um, uh, ecliptic, uh, ecliptic, um, elliptical uh, giants that we've right. talked about. So this actually is a similar thing to what's been found by some of the radial velocity searchers. Okay, so it's, we're, we're sort of finding where we can find overlaps, we are finding some overlaps, so that's good. I'm finding some new ones. There are lots of people involved in this. This is the author list of one paper about It almost this. looks like something from the Large Hadron Collider. Yes, so huge numbers of people from around the world doing all this sort of stuff. Um, and here's the result we get. Um, in this particular case, this is a really neat one because there's a lot going on here. You see lots of different observing situations. So there's a little glitch over here, which is only caught by one or two observations. Then up here, this is not a symmetrical curve. It sort of tilts a bit over there. Then spikes, drops, comes back up again, comes back down, has another spike over here. It's a really complicated pattern. It's pretty interesting. Lots of caustics here and big caustics. So normally I would think when I see something like this, it's a train wreck, it's hopeless. But because we understand the physics of gravity and gravitational lensing so mm -hmm. exquisitely well, we can fit every little piece of this puzzle in something that makes sense. Yes, and as it says down here, we've got a Jupiter mass planet. Um, move over a bit, we'll show that uh, um, it's about 2.3 astronomical units out, and a Saturn mass planet about 4.5 astronomical units out. So that's really beginning to look like our own solar system, just a little com more compact. But the star is only half the mass of the sun and therefore oh. much less luminous than the sun. So in fact, in regard to the snow line and the habitable zone, it's actually almost an exact analogue to our own solar system. Oh, well, that's really, that's really exciting. Yep, so we're seeing a lot of neat stuff with this technique.